We ask you, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will look upon every person in this building, God. We come for you, Lord. We come for you, God. We come to give you glory. We come to give you honor. We come to give you praise, oh God. We ask you, in the name of Jesus, that you will give, that you'll give us your easy yoke, oh God. That you will give us your light burden in the name of Jesus. Lift them off the shoulders of your people in the name of Jesus. Move the mountains, oh God. We need you, oh God, for preparation of the season, oh God. We need you to go before us, oh God. We know that greater is he that is in us, oh God, than he that is in the world. So we trust in your word, God. We trust in you, God. You are mighty and true. You are our strong power. You are our deliverer. You are our king. You are our Lord of Lord. We thank you and make you way in the desert, oh God. We thank you, 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 oh God. We grateful, oh Lord. We're grateful unto you. We're grateful unto you for the new mercy you've given us, God. We thank you for the kindness you showed us. We thank you for pouring out your love unto us, God. We're here for you, God. And we say to have your way, God. Have your way today, God. We need you to have your way. Have your way today, oh God. Have your way today, oh God. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Change our perception, oh God. Change our minds, oh God. Help us to see you clearly, God. Help us to keep our mind on you, oh God. To have your way, oh God. We're trusting in you, God. Let every man be a liar, oh God. And let God be true. We thank you, oh God, that your word is true. God, we're trusting in you, God. Do what you can do. Visit our hearts. Visit our soul. Visit our spirit in the name of Jesus. Pour out your spirit on all flesh as you said you would, God. Even in the book of Joel, you said you would do it. So we're trusting you in this last days, oh God. We know that you would not leave us, nor forsake us, oh God. We thank you that the righteous would not be blessed for bread, oh God. We thank you that you never left us, God. We thank you that you kept us. We thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for your mercy. We'll keep suddenly back. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your mercy. God, you could have been the other way. You should have died. You should have left us out there. But you said, oh God, come up to me. Come and weary. Oh God, you said, come up to me. Come up to me. So we're coming up to you, God. We're coming up to you, Father. Have your way in the name of Jesus. Have your way, oh God. Give us the burden that is light. And the yoke is easy, God. We're here to learn of you, Lord. We need you. God, we need you today, God. We're looking unto you, God. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Because you're deserving of it. You are deserving of it. Holy is your name, God. Holy are you, Lord. So we give you praise, Lord. In the name of Jesus, come today. Do what you can do. Be in the midst of us, oh God. In the name of Jesus, have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. In the name of Jesus, have your way.
hallelujah, and my salvation, hallelujah. Whom shall I fear? Thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah.
can we clap our hands and praise our great God? How great is our God. How great is our God. And we thank the resolute determination to give praise and glory to his name because he has been good to us and he has been faithful to us and he has been kind to us. Anybody thank God for his kindness? Amen. He didn't have to do for me what he did, but because he did. I am exceptionally grateful and thankful. I'm going to invite your attention to the book of 2 Chronicles. That's on the left-hand side of the Bible, amen. If you're of the right, the center, you're in the New Testament. But today, we're making our journey into the Old Testament in the second um, record of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, looking at chapter 24. And while I'm standing here, I'm looking for Brother Junior. Where's Brother Junior? Where'd he go? Amen. Can we clap our hands for Brother Junior today? I don't know, it just might be me, but I think he's getting better and better every Sunday. And I don't know what God is holding him today. But, uh, you know, I'll let his primary instructor speak to that, etc., to, to confirm or verify. But I think the Lord might have touched him a little bit today. Hey, you, you think so too? Yeah, I think the Lord might touch him a little bit today. And I, <laughs> so let's clap our hands for Brother Junior again. That I recognize we're not the easiest music department to play for. We groove it. Amen. We shift and we groove and we're sensitive. And I thank God um, for him being willing to be used of God. And you know what's beautiful? He doesn't even charge me on Sundays to play. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. He plays for us for free. Rendering his talents unto the Lord. And I just hope he can keep that same spirit. Amen. <laughs> And I appreciate that so much. Amen. And to all of our um, guests, we thank God so much for you. Let's clap our hands. Amen. We appreciate everybody. Um, that's here in the house of the Lord. Amen. And I know that you can't hear it today, but I am celebrating with our sister Z, our brother Nate. Amen. We love him. Amen. And we celebrate him and we appreciate him. And we thank God and we are counting down with exuberance. Amen. Um, his return, and we're really grateful to the Lord um, for that. I also need to celebrate our junior ushers today. Amen. Amen. We thank God for them. They're doing a wonderful job. Amen. And I thank God, amen, that our sister Denise is getting a little bit of a break today. Amen. And I thank God for her every Sunday, faithfully in place. Amen. Ushering. And I thank God for her today as well. Um, sister Zenea. Um, walked me up to it. She's trying to walk me to one of those red chairs, I think, but it's all right. I said, I got to play today, but I like, thank God so much for her and to all of you, my father's children. Oh my gosh, and the young people. I got a lot of people to thank God for. Amen. Our young people, the sun being quiet. Amen. They did a wonderful job today, a wonderful job. And all of you that shared your praise reports and testimonies, I thank God. And I would be remiss if I did not make note of our praise and worship team. Amen. We faithfully give praise and glory and honor to God. We thank God um, for them as well. Let's just clap our hands for everybody if we can. Amen. I, I think that many of you by now have found it. Second Chronicles chapter 24. And I'm going to read through a number of verses. So I ask that you forgive me in advance. Is that all right? But we love the word of the Lord, don't we? Amen. Amen. Second Chronicles. Chapter 24, right? Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, right? Y'all got, got that right? And Second Chronicles, Joash, reading from the King James Version, was seven years old. Somebody say seven years old. Seven years old. He was only seven when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Zabia of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. And Jehoiada took for him two wives, and he begat sons and daughters. That's nice. And it came to pass after this that Joash was minded to repair the house of the Lord. He had a great idea to repair the house of the Lord. And he gathered together the priests and the Levites and said to them, Go out into the cities of Judah and gather all of Israel money to repair the house of your God from year to year, and see that he hastened the matter, how be it, the Levites hastened it not. And the king called for Jehoiada, the chief, and said unto him, Why hast thou not required the Levites to bring in out of Judah and out of Jerusalem the collection according to 
the commandment of Moses, the servant of the Lord, and of the congregation of Israel for the tabernacle of witness. For the sons of Athalia, the, that wicked woman, has broken up the house of God, and all the dedicated things of the house of the Lord did they bestow upon Balaam. That's a false god, y'all. And at the king's commandment, they made a chest and set it with our outside at the gate of the house of the Lord. And they made a proclamation through Judah and Jerusalem to bring into the Lord the collection that Moses, the servant of God, laid upon Israel in the wilderness. In other words, Moses had commanded them in the wilderness, and now he's given an opportunity to actually do what was instructed of them. Verse 10, and all the princes and all the people rejoiced and brought it and cast it in the chest until they had made an end. Now it came to pass that at what time the chest was brought into the king's office by the hand of the Levites, and when they saw that there was much money, the king's scribe and the high priest's officer came and emptied the chest and took it and carried it to his place again. Thus they did day by day and gathered money in abundance. And the king and Jehoiada gave it to such as did the work of the service of the house of the Lord, and they hired masons and carpenters to repair the house of the Lord, and also such as brought iron and brass to mend the house of the Lord. So the workmen wrought, and the work was perfected by them. And they set the house of God in his state and strengthened it. And when they had finished it, they brought the rest of the money before the king and Jehoiada, where it were made vessels before the house of the Lord, even vessels to minister and to offer with all, and spoons and vessels of gold and silver. And they offered burnt offerings in the house of the Lord continually all the days of Jehoiada. Verse 15, but Jehoiada waxed. You see that next word? Y'all no, read this? Jehoiada waxed. Oh, yeah. And was full of days when he died. A hundred and thirty years old was he when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and toward his house. Now after the death of Jehoiada, came the prince of Judah and made a message to the king that the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served groves and idols and wrath upon Judah and Jerusalem for their, this their trespass. Yet he, the Lord, sent prophets unto them to bring them again unto the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not give ear. The Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the, the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him and stoned to a stone that escalated quickly at the commandment of the king. For the king was a good guy in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, the Lord will look upon it and require it. And it came to pass at the end of the year that the host of Syria came up against him. And they came to Judah and Jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people. And sent all the spoil of them unto the king of Damascus, for the army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, and the Lord delivered a very great host into their hands, because they had forsaken the Lord God their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And I'm going to pause there. Let's pray, Father. I give you great, I give you praise, glory, and honor for the great things that you have done. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to read your word. I thank you, Lord, that we're able to come publicly and to worship you. And that our lives are not at risk for this opportunity that we have to give glory unto your name. Now, Father, as we attune our hearts to you, we pray, God, that you align us to your divine frequency. Allow us to hear from heaven tonight. God, transform us. God, transition us. God, renew our minds, our hearts, and our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you take your seats, can you tell your neighbor, neighbor, you've got to make it personal. You've got to make it. God bless you. You've got to make it personal. Give me a couple of moments this evening, this afternoon. What time is it? Give me a couple of moments. Afternoon. Amen. I believe we'll see what the Lord has to say and get out of your way. We are being introduced in this text to Joash when he is seven years old. What great responsibility has come upon Joash? He is now reigning over a kingdom. He now has rulership authority. And while many of us would say that that is exceptionally young, despite his youth, he has been under the privilege of having mentors that have tried to guide him and lead him in the paths of righteousness. Um, for those that might not be familiar, Joash is in the position that he is in because his father has been brutally murdered. 
um, down the line from Ahab that had gone and edict to actually destroy the family line, but it was only to exist in the northern kingdom, not to go to the southern kingdom. And so somebody went a little bit too far and started slaying in the family. Um, and not only that, but he has a grandmother, that is, Joash has a grandmother who is, is intent to destroy the royal seed um, in order to maintain her own power. And so in order for Joash, and many of you that have been reading through the Old Testament, this story is familiar to you, in order for Joash to remain protected um, from his own grandmother, he is actually hidden um, by his aunt um, and also by Jehoiada um, in the temple of the Lord. And so I would imagine that Joash begins to develop not only um, an, an affinity for um, the things of God, but also for the house of God because he's intimately acquainted with it. How many of you are trying to intimately acquaint your children with the things of God? I know that the investments that I make in them as young people um, will actually redound to their increase and to their benefit as they grow older. I'm mindful that the examples that we set now have profound influence upon, hopefully, the choices and the decisions that they make later. And to the extent that they make bad decisions, somebody to be a witness and say, it won't be my fault they knew better. It won't be my fault. It's not going to be because I did not tell them, not because I did not train them, not because I did not provide example. Tell your neighbor again, they knew better. They knew better. I made sure they knew better. And so... Um, Joash grows up with all of these positive influences. Jehoiada, um, his aunt, um, whose name also starts with the J, but I'm not going to attempt to embarrass myself today, not today. Yeah, not today. Amen. And, 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 and he is raised um, in the, 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 the right environment, it would appear. And yet, um, so much of his struggle has to do with the fact that even from a young age, people were after his life. And one of the challenges that I'm mindful of young people, not to be macabre, not to be negative, is that your very presence is always a miracle to me. Because I, I, I'm mindful that in the day of the generation that we live in, the statistic used to be that for Generation X, over half of us were killed before we even crossed the womb. And so there is an assault against uh, life in general, an assault particularly against young people. And I found that unfortunately, um, so many things are indiscriminate as it pertains to age. I grew up in a time, Brother Otis, whenever I hear you speak, it's a blessing to me, and I thank God for your presence every week, amen. And all of you, but Brother Otis, um, thank God so much for you. And I remember um, growing up, and. Um, we would attend funerals, and it seemed like funerals skewed towards the older. But then as I began to come of age myself, I found that funerals were getting younger and younger. And so that death was not discriminating on the basis of age, but young people and old people alike were, trans were transitioning from um, here into eternity. And I think that it's very important for us to be mindful of that, um, that death does not discriminate on the basis of age and, and and so Josiah um, was a victim of a plot towards his assassination and he wasn't even old enough to really do much of any damage yet and I know that sometimes um, we discount our young people we don't we wait until people get 18 and 30 and 45 to recognize that they have value but I want you to know in case you've never heard it before that the young people in this ministry they have value right now and then, yeah, you, and then you got to recognize that. And so the enemy begins to target them, right? And it's not when you turn 16 that magically you have value. It's not that when you turn 18 or 25 or 30, uh, but you can have impact at the age of 7. You can have impact at the age of 10. You can have impact at the age of 12. No wonder the Bible says, remember now that I created in the days of thy youth, before the years draw now, and thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Even from a very young age, young people have tremendous 
impact. How young people show up in their classrooms can impact their instructors, their teachers, their peers. How they show up in their neighborhood can impact those with whom they play and have fun. How they show up, even of how they behave in places of business can have profound impact upon those that seem to say, wow, you're so mannerly and so well behaved and cause positive effect, not only for them, but even for their parents. There are parents that have been blessed because of the behavior, the deportment of their children. Tell your neighbor, children matter. I didn't say children will matter. I said children matter right now. And that is why we are so emphatic about welcoming children into the assembly and welcoming children to worship with us because our aspiration is not that one day they will grow up and become Christians and serve the Lord, but our expectation is that even from a young age, they can worship God and give God praise and make a decision for Jesus. I don't speak merely by hyperbole. I speak by experience. I made my own decision for Christ at the age of 11. At the age of 11, I made my choice to follow Jesus because he had been pursuing hard after me. But even in advance of that, I had been hearing the Lord speaking to me. And I want you to know, hallelujah, that some of our young people, you might be surprised to know that God might be speaking to them. Wasn't it the Bible that declared that at a young age, probably around the age of six, that God was speaking even to Samuel, you've got to have the expectation that God's going to do something in the life of my children, even from a young age. And when you become cognizant earlier, of the activity of spiritual forces around your children, when you become cognizant of the fact that God is powerfully at work in the lives of our young people, we become responsible for wise stewardship earlier, for these young people. They're not just um, young people taking up space, but they are uh, people that have assignments from God. They are people that God has a plan and a purpose for. They are people that God desires and has designed to use. Tell your neighbor, God's going to use our young people. God's going to use our young people. God's going to use our young people. And this is why I am intentional. Lady knows it because I say it all the time. I'm intentional. Find a way to get our young people involved. Find a way to get them doing things on music worship. Find a way to get them singing. Find a way to get them ushering. They need to be integrated into the life of the church. Not later, but now. Now, because you can't expect somebody to be disconnected from church all the, the foundational use of their lives and then suddenly at age 18 now want to be integrated into the life of the church. No, we've waited too late. We need to make the proper foundational investments and the time is now. We need to help them to hear the voice of God while they're young so they're able to properly discern between demonic influence and godly influence. You don't hear what I'm telling you because if you don't want to teach them about God, there's somebody outside those four doors that will teach them about horoscopes, teach them about Ouija boards, teach them about everything else that's ungodly curses and all these other things. But you've got an opportunity to teach them more excellently concerning Christ. And if they get a good hold of God in their youth, if they get anchored in the things of God, I'm not telling you they won't go crazy every once in a while. But at some point, the investments that are made younger in life have a tendency of producing results. I don't know if you were, you might have been paying attention as we were reading together about Joash. You might have been intrigued that he was seven years old. You might have been intrigued that he was doing what was right in the sight of the Lord, which reminds me that righteousness is not something that you wait till you're 70 years old to do. I'm going to live my life, enjoy my fun, and when I'm older, then I'm going to serve God. Serving God is not just for those that have run out of energy to sin, but serving God. <laughs> but serving God is for young people. Serving God produces amazing results. You will save yourself tremendous heartache, pain, Difficulty. I'm not saying you'll have a life that is devoid of difficulty and trouble, but all the trouble that you experience, you don't have to experience if you make some firm and good choices in your younger years. Joash does what is right at the outset in the sight of the Lord, but there is a phrase that connects his righteous doing, and that phrase is, 
all the days of Jehoiada, the priest. As we begin to look through this text, we will find that Joash has been so impressed in his youth in being in the temple of the Lord that when he sees the temple of the Lord in disrepair, he sends out a command that the house of the Lord should be repaired, and he even devises a way to finance it. He remembers what was commanded by Moses, which means that somebody must have taught him the commandments of Moses. And as he hears that command, he now brings them into accountability and says, I don't know what's been going on here, but you all have not been living what you have been taught. Let us now align ourselves with divine commandment. Let us bring the offering. This is not an offering appeal, y'all. Let us bring the collections and let us now build the house of the Lord. And the people listen to him and the people do it. And at some point after this successful mandate to build the house of the Lord, when now Jehoiada is 113 years old, Jehoiada dies. That voice, that influence now dies. And now something that I don't know about you, I wouldn't have predicted it. The princes of Judah now come to him. They come and they give proper respect to him. The best is what the text says in the KJV. They give proper deference to him. And after they recognize him, after they uh, they, 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 they honor him, the text says, somehow they got his ear. They never be careful who gets your ear. Oh, y'all quiet. Be careful who gets your ear. Yeah, you see this. I'm not making this stuff up. It says in verse 17, after the death of Jehoiada, came the prince of Judah and made a message to the king. Then the king hearkened unto them. And they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers. And from that moment on, where we now find Joash, who had been so excited about doing the things of God, now is being brought down into idolatry. How in the world did this happen? He now becomes an idolater. And I guess that while we're here, I'll proceed further in the story, but then I need to come back to try to understand what went wrong. Um, he becomes an idolater, but God does not leave himself without a witness. And so God, I believe to be an act of mercy, then sends a prophet, raises up a prophet and says, y'all are messing up. If you forsake the Lord, the Lord will forsake you. It's a very hard lesson and message of truth, but yet the message is delivered. Joash now has the opportunity to amend his ways, to repent and say, you are absolutely right. I have screwed up. Let me listen to Jehoiada's son and get this right, Zachariah. Let me get this right. But he does not do that. But instead, you read the text just as much as I did. He enacts capital punishment upon him. And because the prophet now says him that he does not want to hear. Instead of him hearing and repenting, he kills the prophet and forgets all the good that that prophet's father had done for him and forgets all the lessons that he had learned and forgets all of those sorts of things. And I want to posit to you, GFPM church family, what in the world went wrong? How does Joash go from being one who was raised in the house of the Lord from ages all the way up to the age of six, begin reigning at the age of seven with firm conviction to do what is right in the sight of the Lord and then find himself turning to idols and killing the Lord's prophet. Does that puzzle anybody? Does that challenge anybody? Does that trouble anybody? Does that concern anybody? Does that bring anybody to a higher level of accountability to say, God, help us to do this right? Because I can raise my child in institutional church and things still go wrong. Are y'all praying for me? Y'all praying with me? God, help me to get this right. Because I can't afford to get this wrong. I refuse to raise a Joash. I refuse to invest heavily in the child's developing years and somehow have things turn on. I refuse to allow that to take me. But not my child, not my next generation, not my legacy. No, no way, no way, no way. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. 
Many of you, you read, how many were reading along with me? You read along with me and you heard me talk about his aunt, didn't you? You heard me talk about Jehoiada, didn't you? You heard me talk about um, these things. But sometimes uh, we get distracted so much by what is present, we refuse to acknowledge what's absent. Training is not only that which is active, but training is also that which is passive. There are some things that Joash has learned and has learned quite well and will manifest positively in his own actions. But there are certain things that Joash has learned from absence. And those voids have a voice as well. Tell your neighbor, the voids have a voice. Absence can sometimes accentuate and voids can have voices. Who wasn't there for you, Joash? Who is not mentioned in the narrative of your story? I told you from an early age that his father was killed and there is no firm mention of any input from his mother. Interestingly, in the narrative, as we begin to read it, we do see that his grandmother has quite a bit of animosity towards him and would be um, naive to think that all of these other forces are not having a play or having an impact on who he is. Uh, his family line tells us that he descends from Ahab. He is related there. And so there are some unspoken things going on in his family line that not being properly addressed have a way of producing impact down the line. Tell me, you've got to deal with the stuff you don't want to deal with. You want to deal with the family secrets. You've got to deal with all that craziness and confusion because sometimes it has a way of cropping up in the most unexpected places. Anybody ever find yourself in that situation? You thought that you were good. You had positively advanced yourself and then all of a sudden something comes up in you that you didn't expect to see come up in you and you find out that, oh, that's where that came from. And unless you are intentional about dealing with the stuff that you don't want to talk about, you will find yourself repeating patterns of habits of people that have gone before you. I was never involved in idolatry, but there's something in my family line that makes me if you expose me to it, it starts calling my name. Anybody ever been in a situation where it's not my thing, wasn't my weakness, but there's somebody in my family line that had that weakness and all of a sudden, I didn't realize that when the call came, I was going to answer the way that I did. Uh, this is why for many, we caution within the church, while the Bible has a prohibition against drunkenness, for some of us, we don't need to drink it off, you might say amen, because some of us might have some proclivities in our family line with alcoholism and Drunkenness, such that when alcohol calls us, we might answer four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten times, especially depending on what we're going through in the moment and if we find ourselves vulnerable. Everything can't be for everybody, and you've got to recognize what are the things that uniquely call you? What are the things that uniquely can mess you up? What are the things that can distract you? What distracts you might not distract me. What distracts me might not distract you, but we all got something that can distract us and cause us to yes. Yes. cause us to look the wrong way at the wrong time and I ought not judge you because of what causes you to look I ought not judge you because of your issue or your struggle but what I must do is recognize that I have one and be able to proactively hedge myself against the stuff that is specifically designed to destroy me what could not destroy me physically has now tried to come and destroy me spiritually it was his grandmother that tried to kill him physically but it was also his grandmother's lineage that was killing him spiritually. Ain't it funny how we can be in church and nobody see what's going on behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We can sit in church and look fine, look like we're doing good, but something's going on behind the scenes. And especially when we're young people, people tend to ignore us. They don't tend to hear us. No one wants to engage with us. They don't want to talk to us. But you better realize that some of these young people got some stories. They got some stuff they're going through. And parents, we need to be hearing, hallelujah, what is their encountering spiritually. And just because they do good in the temple, 
just because we have taught them how to do temple sacrifices and temple rituals does not mean they have successfully made it personal. That was the topic, wasn't it? Make it personal. Is it possible that Joash has learned how to do all the stuff of church but never really gets an encounter with God? Is it possible that Joash learns how to build the temple? Joash learns how to do all the construction. Joash learns how to raise offering and raise good money. Joash learns how to do all the external stuff, but nobody realized what was going on that was crying out from Joash's heart. But Joash still had a heart issue that needed to be Who's going to address the heart cries of our children? Who's going to address the heart cries and the yearnings, hallelujah, of that which is in their soul? Who's going to address the voice? Who's going to hear, hallelujah, and accurately be able to speak to the things that they're struggling with that oftentimes they they do not have the vocabulary to articulate? But actions speak loud. God, not help me preach. Actions be louder than words. And at some point, Joash's actions are going to start speaking. When do Joash's actions start speaking? It happens when two pivotal things occur. I'm trying to be good. We got guests. Have a look. If I preach one, we might not come back next Sunday. <laughs> actions speak louder. Two pivotal things occur. The first thing is the death of Jehoiada. Sometimes my success spiritually is linked to somebody externally that's keeping me in check and keeping me accountable. And when that person that kept me accountable is no longer in place. Sometimes parents, I love y'all, but sometimes we provide for our children a false sense of security. Because as long as they're in our roof, there's some stuff you know it ain't going to happen. Right. As long as you live in a district. What did that woman say to raise her son? In my house, there will be God. Y'all ain't watched that. Raising in the sun. Historical African American, you know, play. No? From the 1960s, I think it was. Girl got there, thought she got smart, tried to become an atheist in her mother's house. Mm-hmm. Now you say it after me in my mother's house. There is still gold. <laughs> and so there are certain things that are associated, and even for children that live outside their family, their, 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 their family structure, out their, their, their parental um, homes, um, just the fact that the parents are alive, there are certain things they won't do. The, I don't want mama to see me doing this. I don't want father to see me doing this. But the test of the authenticity of your Christian experience is what happens sometimes when they're no longer around. Sometimes that happens in the death of the parents. Sometimes that happens when children go to college. But at some point there is an age of reckoning where you begin to make decisions without the close and watchful eyes of those that might have the most powerful impact upon your daily lived experiences and it's in those moments that we really begin to find out the extent to which you have made it personal. But here's the second thing that happened that you might have missed. I'm trying to move towards my conclusion. And the second thing that happens in the text that you might have missed is that the house of the Lord gets built. What happens when the sum total of my spiritual experience surrounds itself or is defined by doing the church work? Building the temple. And now that the temple has been built, what else is there left for him to do? If all of my experience has been around doing the external markings, of doing the external service, of doing all the external things, doing all the administration of what makes the temple the temple, and now finally it's completed, he has no longer any spiritual definition that goes beyond the superstition. The, the superficiality of mere external observance. He doesn't have a depth that goes any further beyond. I go to church. I pay my tithes. I do this. I do that. But nothing deeper is able to actually bring him into anchoring and subjection to the things of God. You know this because he cares more about the temple than he does about the prophet. 
He cares more about the building than he does about people. And so his heart will become vexed when he sees the temple in disrepair, but he has no problem sitting to the assassination of a person. And we've got to be really careful that we do not breed in our generations people that are so concerned about the religiosity and so concerned about the building and so concerned about the rules and the regulations and all these sort of things that we are willing to assassinate people. Amen. I'm preaching harder than y'all say amen. Because we are living in a time where people that say they love Jesus have no issue killing one another amen. in the name of religion. Killing one another in the name of righteousness. Killing one another, assassinating one another, etc. And one of the things we've got to be able to teach, hallelujah, in this church age is that the, the commandment, thou shalt not kill, still needs to remain intact. And you might say, I didn't take out a knife, I didn't take out a gun, I didn't take out an Uzi. I'm dating myself. <laughs> But sometimes our tongues can more, do more damage than a machine gun ever could have. The Bible says you bite and devour each other. Are you not carnal? And we've got to get a mindset that, 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 that values people, that values how your life, that values how to the voice of God. And unfortunately, um, Joash was willing to preserve the place of God, but he did not value the presence of God. He did not value the voice of God. And we've got to teach our young people how do they learn how to appreciate the presence and the voice of God. Because I'm telling you, there are many young people that have grown up in generations before that have grown up in church and still they will not smoke in front of a church building. They will walk across the street if they are drunk. But unfortunately, their daily lives do not glorify God because they're more concerned about religion than they are about relationship. They never ever made it personal. It never became a thing where it was like, oh, me and God, we got a really important thing going on. They had a relationship with the church, and because church hurt them, now they left church and won't return anymore. But I want to let you know when this thing comes personal, it doesn't matter. Everybody in the church can look at me funny. I'm still coming to where God is because I have a relationship with God that goes beyond you. You can roll your eyes every Sunday. I'm still good because I've got a relationship and a connection with God. Hallelujah. With my enemies, even my foes, came upon me to eat of my flesh. They stumble and fell, though a host rise against me. And this will I be confident. One thing have I desired. I said, one thing have I desired the Lord. And that will I seek after. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What does that mean? Why do we go from enemy stumbling and falling to beholding the Lord? I'll tell you why. Because I've learned that when I see my enemies plotting against me, all I've got if I can still look to God, if I can still see Jesus in the midst of everything I'm going through, I, none of this other stuff matters. It doesn't move me. It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't discourage me. It doesn't dissuade me. I'm going with Jesus all the way. All the way from earth to glory. All the way from here to eternity. All the way from here to heaven. I'm Tell your neighbor it's got to become personal to you. It's got to become personal. That's why we still have how your testimony service in the middle of church. It's great for me to tell you how good God is. But every once in a while, you've got to get up and speak from your own mouth and say, You don't know what I know. What he's done for me. I get joy. What is done for me? At some point, it's got to become. It's got to become personal. We cannot simply have our children listen to what we talk about. How do we sit there as audiences and merely as sponges? No, at some point, they've got to sing the songs too. Because when they go to school, they need to have the song of the Lord in their hearts. When the enemy's trying to confuse them, they need to have something in the side of them that says, shake, 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 shake the devil off. Wouldn't it be awesome? How do they when struggle and difficulty shows up in the classroom? If there's a saved young person, then I'm going to shake this 
fell off. The devil is a lie. You can try to attack us if you want to, but Satan, I rebuke you. Shake the devil off. And I want you to know that demons don't recognize ages. It doesn't matter if you're three years old or if you're 80 years old. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. It does not matter if it's a toddler, a teenager, or an octogenarian. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've got to teach your toddlers. Call on Jesus. Teach your teenagers.
Hallelujah. 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 Make it personal. Make it personal. Make it personal. Joash, I'm sorry that somebody didn't teach you how to make it personal. I'm sorry that somebody just gave you that old time religion and never allowed you to have it be your own. I'm sorry that somebody gave you Saul's armor without recognizing that David can be never be successful trying to use armor that was not custom designed for him. I'm sorry to the generation that was forced uh, to adopt a methodology and understanding that was not fit for purpose for your current contextualization. That you were not able to learn God, hallelujah, personally for who he is to you. Oh, y'all don't hear me, hallelujah. Joash has got to know God for himself. He can't just know church. He can't just know the rituals. He can't just know the traditions. All of these things are designed to point you to the God whom we serve. I like this story, so I tell it a lot. And even though I'm finished, it doesn't count towards my time. <laughs> because I like this story a lot. Thank you. The deacon said I could do it. <laughs> if she said I couldn't, I might have still done it. <laughs> there was a father who bought his son a telescope. And the son was naturally inquisitive and enjoyed the telescope very much. He takes the telescope in his room, proceeds to take it apart, dissects the telescope, breaks it all apart, and looks at all the intricate pieces, understands all the beauty of how the telescope works, Fascinated by the telescope, enamored by the telescope, grateful for the telescope. After a couple of days, the father would come back to the son and say to the son, how are you enjoying the telescope? Oh, I love it. I love the telescope. I took it apart. Understand how it works? You know, the refractory, a mirror, all this kind of stuff understands all the, the, the intricacies. I can take it apart, put it back together, look at that. He says, well, how would you enjoy looking at the stars? The son said, I never considered doing that. And there are people that will dissect this word, break it apart. I understand all the pieces. And when I ask them, so what do you know about God? Have you had an encounter with him? You will spend your life reading about people that had encounters with God without an expectation that you have an encounter with God yourself? You'd rather read about Moses having an encounter with God at the burning bush and never think that perhaps the reason why that story is there is that you might pursue a relationship with God yourself. That somehow God did not mean for you simply to be the external observer of someone's narrated experience, but that God actually expected that you would be part of the story too. Tell your neighbor, I'm part of this story too. I am part 